You're listening to audio from the Decidedly Podcast. For more information, find us on Instagram at Decidedly Podcast. Did you ever have just stupid thoughts as a kid growing up that you recall? I don't know if I remember exactly what they were, but I'm sure I had dumb ones. Yeah. Dumb ones I, had. I I had this anxiety one time I was sitting in the back of the room uh, with my best friend, Gene, and we're sitting in the back and he he's helping me because I've got a hole in the crotch of my blue jeans. You know, so my tidy whities are showing. Okay. And I said, oh no, you know, everybody's going to see, you know, and everybody's going to, that's going to be so embarrassing. And, you know, I was just frozen with panic. I'm like, what do I do? Because I'd ripped him at recess or something. And he goes, oh, I know what to do. I have, I have the solution. Because we were sitting in the back of the room and there was this chalkboard in the back and it had this blue chalk. He goes, take this blue chalk dust that's in the, t- in the chalk <laughs> and rub it on your fingers and cover up the underwear with blue chalk <laughs> so it'll camouflage the blue and nobody will be it'll it'll fool everybody nobody will see i'm like oh that's brilliant yes this is this is the solution so i'm i'm grabbing all this blue chalk dust off the chalkboard <laughs> with my hand and so i just start rubbing it on the tidy whities you know, the, yeah. you know, the crotch of my blue jeans and so i'm just going to town and oh the, t- <laughs> the teacher the teacher stops class says, <laughs> sean can i see you outside <laughs> I'm like, oh no oh no so now i gotta get up and i gotta walk you gotta with, explain why you're playing with, with yourself chalk, in the back with of chalk the room. dust dropping down you know i got this trail of chalk dust following me out the room and you're talking to me in the hall she goes um i noticed that you, you know like what are you what are you doing you're paying a lot of attention to your crotch <laughs> in class it's like, and I start crying. I'm like, I have a hole in my pants, and everybody's gonna see. It. So I didn't explain. She, so I, I think she believed me when I showed her the blue, my blue hand, you know, yeah. full of chalk nuts. But I was, but it was just this. It was overwhelming. I, I was frozen, and I couldn't make really good decisions because I was so, I was so upset by this. <laughs> so you're frozen in I, fear. I was. In, I was. And and uh, I mean also. You know, being six years old, not that's didn't, unhelpful to didn't, the I wasn't making, making my process. best decisions at six. No, no, that's hilarious. So I think even as adults, we, when we get under stress and when we are afraid, we are not likely to come with the best solution. No, you know, you can look back on that obviously now and go, you could have just told the teacher. I could have just <laughs> left. Yeah, or could have just taken it on the chin. Like, right, ah, right. it just happens, man. Right. Yeah, my pants ripped. You could have just walked out. So I'm going to the restroom. But being that calm, all of those solutions require you to be calm. And being calm is difficult under fear. And coming up with the right decision or the optimal decision, or at least not the absolute worst decision. Not the worst one. <laughs> that requires some level of awareness uh, and competency over handling our own thoughts and emotions. Today, we talked to an expert in becoming more aware of our thoughts and specifically detoxing our thoughts. Andrea Bonnier is our expert guest on the podcast today. She is a best-selling author, speaker, professor, and licensed clinical psychologist who's made a career of translating the science of psychology into meaningful real-life change. A keynote speaker on stress management, workplace wellness, coping, burnout, motivation, and emotional health for 15 years. Andrea was the voice behind the mental health advice column, baggage check for the Washington Post. When she's not making guest appearances on CNN's The Lead with Jake Tapper, she blogs for Psychology Today, where her pieces have been read more than 25 million times. Andrea consults with authors, directors, and screenwriters on psychological aspects of their characters and plot lines to ensure accuracy and realism involving mental health issues. Dr. Bonnier is a featured expert psychologist for many other media outlets and still finds time to maintain a part-time private therapy practice outside her home in Washington, D.C. We had so many great takeaways from this conversation with Andrea. Becoming gentle observers of your environment to manage big reactions, 
labeling your thoughts as thoughts. I know it sounds a little crazy, but let her talk to you about it. It's the first step to gaining distance from overwhelming emotions. She talked to us about how we are not our thoughts. We can observe and access our thoughts. She calls it cognitive diffusion. We talked about neutralizing your toxic thoughts, the way we were spoken to as children, how that impacts our thoughts even today as adults, naming and feeling emotions without self-destructing, and how fear freezes decision-making. So stick around. You're going to learn a lot from our conversation with Andrea, uh, and hopefully you'll get a good laugh in. I'm Sanger Smith. As always, I'm with my dad, Sean Smith, and this is Decidedly. Andrea, thanks for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah, I can tell that we're going to get along. And you know how I can tell that we're going to get along is how How's you that? interact with Morgan while we're getting all set up. So, you know, Morgan, our ah. producer, she's got her her little lovely baby with her all the time. And listening to y'all interact, it made me think of that video that came out almost three years ago. There's this guy, yeah. uh, right, you know, during the COVID shutdowns, everyone's working at home. There was some guy on like CNN or something. You know exactly yes. what I'm talking about. His little child. Oh, yeah. In the room. Where the kid runs in, like dancing behind it. He's trying to talk about world economics or something yeah, like he's that. He's talking oh about global, God. you know, macro policy. And he like takes a switch out and beats the kid on camera. Basically, <laughs> so get out of here. This is so much more important than you. <laughs> is that the one where like the the maid oh. runs in and like grabs i mean grabs i the thought kid it, i always like, thought it was mom uh, running or, or, it, was yeah. mom. it was mom people thought people thought it was the nanny but it was the mom and i gotta tell you that was almost a re-traumatizing experience for me because although my three kids are older than that kid was the interruptions were still constant you know <laughs> especially when they were learning from home so even though they were older and knew they weren't supposed to make sounds if i'm on live television they couldn't help it or somebody starts singing or somebody starts arguing over the last snack that's in the kitchen. And I was like, serenity now. So seeing that was validating, but also it was, it was a little anxiety producing because I'm always just a step away from that happening. Well, <laughs> Morgan wanted to make sure we knew she wasn't beating her kid with a stick just now. <laughs> <laughs> we got a little message. Oh, she's safe. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it, I think it's... Um, it, it's kind of like telling about what people believe and is important based on how they react to other people in the Zoom world that have mm -hmm. their family in the background. I mean, I, people yes. that are overly apologetic of their own kids' existence um, mm -hmm. when I'm on Zoom with them, it makes me uncomfortable. I'm like, dude, it's okay. Oh, then you start getting nervous. I'm about like, it too. you have a four year old. Like, yeah, it's I get all, it. It's yeah. all yeah. good, man. I mean, I don't really get it. I don't have a four year old, but I feel like maybe. You know, you being a dad right now, it's like, yeah. it's probably yeah. more important than whatever BS we're talking about. So it's okay, <laughs> man. Like they want to grow cheese, you know, it's, it's yeah. a learning opportunity. It's Totally. It's so hard to feel like that, though, because I think a lot of managers and supervisors, even if they have kids themselves, they're just not empathetic toward it. They are very strict. They make you feel ashamed of it. I actually did. I, I hosted a LinkedIn learning class on balancing work and home during the pandemic for parents. And this was a constant issue that people were made to feel ashamed. People were made to feel bad that the very existence of some background noise was a deal breaker. And and it really led to a lot of anxiety and even more burnout than parents were already experiencing during the pandemic, which is saying something. That's crummy. I, yeah. I don't I don't want people to feel that way. I want people to feel the opposite. Yeah. I want people to feel like working for me is helping them be a better mom or a better dad. Mm -hmm. If they feel like they've got to yeah. sacrifice that to work for me, mm, gross. I don't want to be doing whatever yeah. it is I'm doing. I think some, totally. sometimes we just don't get aware of, you know, we have a, a bias that we bring to any interaction. And even if you're trying not, if you don't say, hey, put the kid away, get rid of it, you know, get, or not get rid of it, but you know, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. lock yeah. the kid out of the, in, yeah. in, in another room, uh, that, that your attitude sort of comes through. You sort of, you, you know, you'll make a face or you'll like be short with somebody and they, they get it. It's, it's hard to moderate those if you're if you're mm -hmm. not aware of those original bias to say oh I, you know i'm probably making this person feel like uh, feel bad 
you know, I'm not trying yeah. to, but it's coming through anyway. Right. My my wife accuses me of being too transparent with my with my feelings. <laughs> and I, mm-hmm. She will. She goes, yeah. oh, you know, you were such you know, you were rude to that guy. I said, no, I wasn't. She goes, oh, yeah, no, you you were. She, no, I was just being quiet. No, you were you were being a jerk, yeah. and so like, oh. <laughs> you don't have a poker face. No, well, that's what she said. She goes, "You don't have a yeah. poker face. You, yeah. you know, it was very obvious what you were thinking and feeling, even though you thought you were hiding it." And right. so, when when we're trying to, you know, you famously author of Detox Your Thoughts, how do we th- become more aware of what we are thinking and feeling? so that we can moderate that. If it's the unknown unknown, you know, on the on Jahari yeah. window, if we're not even yeah. aware of it, how do we become aware of it so that we can fix it? You know, it takes time and it takes a willingness to not run away from some of the thoughts that you're having, because I think sometimes what leads to us not being aware of our thoughts is that we have stuffed them because on some level we believe that they are unacceptable to have. So the whole concept of mindfulness that I think people miss when they start to learn about mindfulness is the curiosity and acceptance, the non-judgmentalness, the gentleness, because I think so many of us have spent a lifetime thinking that we're not supposed to have certain thoughts. And so for us, of course, we're not aware of those thoughts on the surface because we've told ourselves if we have them, we're bad. You know, if I am bored at this party and frustrated that this person's taking up all my time when I really want to go home, it's unkind for me to think that. So therefore, I'm not going to think it, but guess what? It's showing in my body language. It's showing in my face. And the truth is, it's not unkind to have certain thoughts. Typically, what we need to do is figure out our behavior of how to be the person we want to be and our values. So I would say step one of really becoming aware is being willing to observe and being willing to label your thoughts as thoughts and not be as threatened by them. So to really spend some time noticing your inner dialogue. Now this, or monologue, I should say, this varies for people. You know, (laughs) I never realized how much people's inner monologue really varied from person to person until I became a therapist. Because I personally... I'm always thinking something, right? I mean, whether I'm paying attention to my thoughts or not, there's sort of always something going. And then I became a therapist and I realized some people, they're not always thinking something. Some people, when they zone out, they really mean they zone out as in it's blank, not they zone out because they're fast forwarding in their mind to something else or they went on a tangent. And so for some people, it is harder to really observe their thoughts in a way because they don't necessarily have this running stream of consciousness type of thought. For other people, they're like, oh yeah, you know, my thoughts are always going. My inner monologue is always going. I can tell you if I actually pause any given moment, I'm thinking about the gyro I ate two weeks ago, and I'm very aware of that if I pause. So there's going to be variation. You know, some people just, they don't have that same level of that river running through their head at all times. But any of us, no matter to what extent we think, can learn to become these gentle observers. And the gentleness, I can't emphasize that enough, because when we start to add the layer of judgment on top of the thoughts, that's when we have problems. So why do you use the word gentle observer? Yeah, because I think it means that we deserve to look at those thoughts without extra condemnation, without shame, without saying you're bad because you have this thought. And so we're being gentle in the sense that we're not immediately reacting because what a lot of people do, especially if they have behavior or mood challenges or they're really struggling They react to their thoughts immediately in a judgmental way. And it's not usually very judge, it's not usually very gentle. So they say, Oh, why am I thinking that? I'm so lazy. Why don't I have more willpower? Or, oh, why am I thinking that? What a jerky thing to think. You need to have, you know, more compassion for this person. Or, oh, why am I thinking that? This is my whole problem. This is why I don't succeed in life because I have these negative thoughts and I'm only supposed to have happy thoughts, which is such a myth, right? Because what we really have learned from the research over the past 10 or 20 years in psychology is that it's not negative thoughts alone that cause anxiety, depression, 
self-sabotage, any of the things that we generally want to, to help ourselves avoid, it's not negative thoughts alone. It's our reaction to those thoughts. It's our negative thoughts becoming sticky. We start giving our thoughts power. They become patterns. We start ruminating. We start obsessing. We start giving those thoughts credence. We start judging ourselves because of those thoughts. It's really common to have thoughts and then to have thoughts about the thoughts and then the thoughts about the the thoughts are often where we start to see self-sabotage and we, you know, that's where we kind of hurt ourselves. Yeah. Our friend, Doug Linick, he was on the podcast a while back. He is a pioneer in our industry in the area of behavioral finance. And he was the first person that I heard talk about thinking about your thinking, right? Yes. Metacognition or whatever you, you want to call it. And he, I remember he had this thing that uh, he said that stood out to me. He goes, I know it might seem like an advantage to you that I think about what I think about, but uh, it's, it's an unfair advantage that I have. And I go, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. But I, I think you, you can only get to that level of understanding of, of thoughts and the thinking process through extensive research and understanding of psychology. How did you, what was your journey like to get to this point. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, my best friend, my childhood best friend wanted to be a psychologist. I thought that was the worst (laughs) job idea in the world. I thought who could possibly want to sit and listen to other people's problems. Yeah. (laughs) Other people's problems all the time. Who would want to take that on? That just sounded terrible to me. I've got enough problems of my own. Why would I want to do that? And so I definitely was not someone who wanted to do that since childhood. And ironically, you know, I'm still close with that dear friend and she ended up having nothing to do with psychology. So the the joke was on both of us, I think. Um, I started getting into it in college just with coursework. I took my first psychology class, my first year of college, fall semester. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. But I was much more interested in theory in becoming an English major. I wanted to to do something with writing, with communications. Of course, I ended up doing that somehow anyway. Um, But I really started to love the science of psychology, the more that I learned, because it really did apply, in my mind, to everything. It applied to history. It applied to culture. It applied to even finance. It applied to literature and art. It applied to how people made inventions. So I became fascinated. I still didn't necessarily think I wanted to become a therapist until I became a peer counselor. And I noticed that I sort of had had a role with friends of being the one that people came to. And I valued that very much. And I treasured that. And so I did some volunteer counseling, some peer counseling at my university. And after a while, the pieces just fit together. I thought, you know, it's so clear that I love the science of this, that I love the practice of this, that I really could see myself doing this. And in all honesty, too, it really appealed to just the whole person in me that I knew that I wanted to do sort of different things. I didn't want to have a nine to five in the same office all day. I could see myself doing a little bit of teaching, a little bit of writing, a little bit of research, a little bit of clinical practice, and even a little bit of broadcasting and media work and speaking gigs. And somehow I was able to end up doing all of that. So, and also having the flexibility, I knew that having a family someday was very important to me. And it all just seemed to fit in the way that I wanted to learn everything I could about this field so that someday I'd have the autonomy to build the kind of life that I wanted. And I've been very, very privileged to be able to do that. Tell me about how the the Washington Post blog started. Uh, baggage check was pretty popular. How did you end yes. up? I mean, there's a lot of psychologists out here. Not, of all, not all of them turn into authors and gurus. <laughs> yes. Well, that was a funny story because I had just moved back to the D.C. area after doing my pre-doctoral internship in Miami. And um, there was a new sort of new arm of the Washington Post. This was back in 2004 that was being developed as a commuter newspaper. So it was a version of the Washington Post that was going to be given out at metro stations, you know, a quarter of a million circular people read it every day. Um, and at that time, as a break from my dissertation, which is very heavy science types of writing. As a little secret break from my dissertation, I had been writing an advice column for this web magazine. And it was just, it was my, it was my break. I was like, I want to be able to talk about mental health issues, but not 
with scientific jargon. I want to address real people. I want to make some jokes. I want to be able to be a human. But I kind of kept it under wraps and it wasn't framed as this is official scientific advice or anything. I think I didn't even, I didn't even have my full name on there. And one of the executives at the Post somehow became a fan of that and had read it. And he contacted me via email one day saying, hey, I'm from the Post. I really love your stuff. What would you think about writing for us? And the funny thing about the story is I thought it was a joke. And so (laughs) I immediately forwarded it to my husband. He was my fiance at the time. We or we were just we had just gotten married, actually. He'd probably be horrified if I told this story. He accidentally replied all. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so this is back in the day, you know, this is 2004. I think he had Microsoft Outlook at the time or something. And I forwarded it to him like, is this one of your friends? Like, what is this? You know, sort of like a what the what? kind of thing. Is this for real? Is this a joke? And he replied to me. And it was the late Christopher Ma. Unfortunately, he's passed away since he was a wonderful, wonderful man that was at the post. But my husband replied to him and me. And meanwhile, I had not replied to Chris Ma yet. And um, (laughs) he luckily, it was nothing offensive. It was just something like, whoa, you know, check. This is probably for real. Congratulations, babe. What's going on? Contact him back or something. He called me before I had seen it. I think I was on my way home. And he's like, "Um, yeah, so I did something really bad and stupid. I was like, what? He's like, well, (laughs) anyway, Chris Ma was really cool about it. He replied to us both. He's like, "Um, yeah, I want to talk to Andrea. (laughs) And then we talked and the rest of his was history. Now I was there for 15 years. Express was the name of that sort of arm of the post. At some point it would appear in the regular post itself. Um, I was there for 15 years and we had a live chat and it was amazing. And they've sort of revamped things now, which is why I decided to take baggage check indie because it was such, I mean, it was like one of the most popular chats and had the biggest audience engagement. Um, it was such a blast. And I loved, I loved that. Of course, eventually people started reading their phones on the Metro instead of the newspaper. So that newspaper express ended, I think in 2019, maybe. And then I was with the regular post for a while, still am in some capacity, but the great thing has been turning it into a podcast. Um, that's been indie because, and that just launched in November and we've had such a great, that's a, that's a big decision. I mean, going independent, I'm an independent advisor. Mm -hmm. It's hard to make a decision to leave a big, the safety net, so to safety speak. Safety net, yeah. yeah. Totally. You know, it really was. And I had never truly done anything indie. You know, my books were with traditional publishers. Because um, at some point, I was lucky enough to get book deals because people were reading my stuff for the post. Um, I had never really carved out anything indie. I, I did stuff with big media a lot. And I still love the role of big media, but I also think in this climate and we're seeing everything that's happening, you know, unfortunately with media companies, even over the past few months, and it always seems to repeat, there are layoffs. There are incredibly talented people that for whatever reason are not kept on. Um, and so I also, for the first time, wanted to actually have my audience be in one place as mine, you know, because I think I also write for psychology today and it's a similar thing. I've written for them for 10 years or so, a blog there, and, you know, I've got, I don't know, 25 million readers or what, not readers, but views of, of posts or whatever. But at some point it's like, okay, well, that's not really, it's not really mine. I can't totally have editorial control. I mean, they're very good. And the post was very good too. And I had magnificent editors and I felt like I could always have my voice be authentic, but there's also something to say for the idea of everything starting and ending with me and being like, you know, I think this topic is important, even if an editor doesn't, or I think that we really need to say this, even if the word count is now 200 over. You know, of course, in a podcast, there is no word count concern so much, right? So I think that's part of what drew me is that I've loved the media companies that I have worked for and continue to work for. But I also love the idea of having my own voice. Same thing with CNN. I really enjoy going on there. And I really love how they let me speak my voice. But I wanted to have a place that was fully mine. 
where I didn't have to always have the lens of there's a producer, there's an editor, you know, how's the audience going to respond? The audience for better or for worse of my podcast, they're going to tell me and it stops with me what they thought. And I don't have to feel like I'm looking through the lens of what somebody else thought. In all of that work is, is we look at absorbing content like that and you're putting out a lot of content on mental framework and how to think about things. Are there recurring decision-making issues that people continue to struggle with that you see over and over? All the time, all the time. In fact, I just had an episode on self-sabotage because I think what I see in my clients and what I see in people who write into the podcast It is this notion that there's a right decision and, oh my goodness, I'm going to blow it and everything comes down to this decision and, uh uh-oh, now I have regrets and I made the wrong decision, so therefore I'm going to continue to make the wrong decision or the self-sabotage that comes from information overload. You know, I see that a lot. People that have an important decision to make and they almost lose sight of their gut instinct because there's so much perseveration on all the information that's out there. And there's a point at which where we have paralysis with decision-making because there are too many. And I know this has been written about in the business world a lot in the sense of, you know, maybe we don't need to see 19 different types of toothpaste in order (laughs) to actually take care of our teeth, you know? And I think we've almost come to this with personal decisions too. Well, let me see what this listserv would have to say. Let me look this up. Let me look at the video. And it's almost like we're not, first of all, not all of the sources of information are that reliable. So that's a problem, right? I mean, I I keep seeing all this data on how younger generations, for instance, they go to TikTok for restaurant reviews. You know, people are starting to not Google at all in the younger generations. Not that Google should have been the end all be all, but it's very interesting how people are using social media for research. You know, like if I wanted to find a good Thai restaurant in whatever city I'm in, it would never occur to me to go to TikTok, right? I would say, hey, let me do an internet search, but this is all changing. Anyway, my point is that there are so many sources of information and there's so much information overload for a lot of people that I think that negatively affects decision-making because I think that people don't know how to filter out what is valid and accurate and reliable information. Some of this emotion, some of this information appeals to our emotional reactions. And so we go on that alone. And the next thing we know, we feel unsure of what we did. We've had several discussions uh, looking at how do you, how do you source the right data? In other words, if, Mm -hmm. if certain content is coming at you, but this content is not accurate, how do you know that? And so if you're looking at your own thoughts and your thoughts are are sabotaging your behavior. How do you begin to recognize that those are self-sabotaging thoughts to be because that's going to negatively impact your decision making obviously. How do you how do you get yeah. back to square one and recognize that you have these toxic thoughts and then correct them? Oh, it's such a great question because that's the crucial battle. So the first step is really labeling your thoughts as thoughts. And in that Wait, way, what? you can labeling your thoughts as thoughts. So yeah, so it's super simple and also super profound in a way. So I'm having the thought that I shouldn't go to this party rather than I shouldn't go to this party. I'm having the thought that I should have taken that other job. I'm having the thought that I screwed up that presentation. All This is step one because labeling our thoughts as thoughts immediately allows us a bit of distance from them. It it allows us to become that observer that we're after, you know, and that's kind of the heart of mindfulness is that observation. As we said, that gentle, curious, non-judgmental observation. So when we label our thoughts as thoughts, this is the first step of getting some distance from them because now we have told ourselves that our thoughts are not necessarily true and they're not necessarily us. We are not our thoughts, right? We can observe our thoughts. And so labeling our thoughts from the get-go is step one of this process to start observing them. And then we can start to assess 
Is this a distortion? Is this thought telling me a true story? Is this thought an unreliable narrator? People love that analogy in therapy. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, that's my anxious thought. It's, it's a liar. It's my mental bully. You know what I, the metaphor I use a lot too, is the heckler in the audience, right? The comedian's up on stage and there's some guy in the audience jabbering on who's drunk and heckling. In that moment, we can't totally make him shut up, but we also need to make sure that we recognize that he is not my monologue right now. I can still keep the audience going by neutralizing him. I don't have to scream at him and make him a thing and give him that much attention and fight with him and now my act is ruined. But I also am not going to totally ignore him because he's going to get louder. So I can recognize, I, you know, good comedians do this all the time. They have a heckler and they have a two sentence quip that kind of puts it in their place and they move on. And the heckler's kind of like, okay, I'm not getting the attention I wanted. I'm done. So recognizing that thought as a thought and labeling it as a distortion, now we can start to say, is there credence here? Is this thought giving me strength or insight? Is this thought even true or is it a distortion? Is it a distortion? You know, I talk with my clients all the time about the lenses that we look through because so many of us, we're not, none of us really are ever completely objective about anything because we're human beings. But so many of us have these constantly distorted lenses. They're wavy, they're blurred, they're cracked, they're dirty, and they affect the way that we see the world. And if we can gain some distance by saying, I am looking through this lens that I tend to have, it's my social anxiety lens, or it's my self-sabotaging lens, or it's my guilty conscience lens, or it's my negative cynic lens. I'm looking through that lens now I can actually recognize that maybe it's a distortion and maybe I can let some light in and say, here's an alternative way of looking at it. Now, sometimes maybe your thought is a true thought. Maybe it is, but it's bothering you so much. You're ruminating, you're obsessing. Maybe you did screw up at work. It still can be helpful to label it as a thought. I'm having the thought that I screwed up that presentation. I know that I did. That is a true thing. But right now, this is the 37th time that I've thought about this presentation in the past hour. Is it giving me strength? Is it giving me insight? Is it helping me strategize? Is it helping me move forward? Does it have something new to tell me? Hmm, no, because I'm pretty much on round 37 of the same thing. Okay, then. Now let's think about letting the thought pass because it might as well be a distortion because it doesn't have anything interesting to say. And when we let the thought pass, there's all kinds of ways to do that. We can do some breathing exercises. We can get a change of scenery. We can have a metaphor where we picture the thought like a leaf on a stream that's going down and it's eventually going to get, you know, there's all kinds of things. But that first step is always key of, we call it cognitive diffusion, diffusing, separating from your thoughts as an observer. You know, some people, they'll do this in the third person and it sounds so ridiculous, but it actually helps. What do you mean? Andrea's having the thought that she screwed up. Andrea's having the thought that nobody at this party is going to like her. Andrea's having the thought that her marriage is going to break up. Andrea's, these are all hypothetical, by the way. These are, (laughs) I should mention that my husband's going to listen later and be like, is there something that we need to talk about? Andrea's having the thought that she's going to foul this up. Or Andrea's having the thought that, you know, back in eighth grade, she did this thing and I can't believe I did this. You know, if you can actually refer to yourself in the third person, it sounds so hokey and people are resistant at first, but then they recognize that it actually helps with cognitive diffusion. It helps with distancing yourself from your thoughts because ultimately we have all kinds of thoughts, right? Like I said before, some people have thoughts all day, every day. Some of them are helpful. Some of them are not. Some of them are true. Some of them are not. Some of them are completely random. Yeah. And we don't have to define ourselves. And they, by those and they aren't necessarily our thoughts in the sense that like our soul and our mind and our heart are all aligned to make us believe a certain yes. thing. They're influenced by the things that we heard other people say commonly in our life. Um, yes. or the environments that we were in that made us feel a certain way, even though in our logical uh, brain, we would feel and think differently. What exactly type of pushback do people give you when you suggest that they go about this process? <laughs> All different types of pushback. 
a lot of people just are not used to thinking of their thoughts in this way. They immediately have that reaction to their thoughts to the point where they want to judge themselves for it. They say, well, no, I need these thoughts to go away, right? That's the classic, that's the classic sort of stance that a lot of people take. They come in to see me, they have anxiety. They hate these thoughts with a passion. They're anxious thoughts. And so they say, why do I think this? I need to stop thinking this. How do I get these thoughts to go away? Yeah. So they don't want you to tell them to spend time with the thought to conquer it. Exactly. They want you to tell them what pill they can take so that it will never show up again. <laughs> or yes, in other words, or even, what easy solution will solve this problem and right. require no work on well, my part? It, it, it does seem very simplistic, though, to say, gosh, you know, if I keep telling myself I'm, you know, I'm so stupid to just go, well, just quit telling yourself that. Just don't tell yourself that. It's, it's got to be more complex than that, I would think, right? Right. What, it, right, exactly. Because that's complex than that. I know. That's what I'm saying. It is. Yeah. And that's what people have been told, though, because I will say with psychology, self-help, not even psychology, with the self-help movement over the years and think positive thoughts and just think happy thoughts and all of this, I think a lot of people have been told that the key is just thinking positive and getting rid of negative thoughts, and that's going to help them. And we know that that doesn't work. We know that we can't just stop thinking certain thoughts. So I don't blame these people one bit for thinking the answer is for me to no longer ever have an anxious thought again. I need to find a way to not think in an anxious way. They're often very surprised when they realize, hey, ironically, the path to actually being free of these anxious thoughts is to disempower them, not by trying not to think them, but by recognizing them as a distortion and developing a totally different relationship to them. How much of you this know, because I, do you think stems yeah. from how we were spoken to as children, right? Uh, uh, you're fine. Stop crying. It's okay. Stop whining. Yeah. Big it's boys no don't big cry. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. And in fact, I did a piece for the post on this not too long ago about the ways that we raise our children to make them scared of their thoughts and feelings, which ironically, I do think Singers, is Singers making uh, shooting laser lasers out of his eyes at me. Right now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Is this going to turn into a family therapy uh, session? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, this was all a ruse. This was a long con. See, this, yeah. see what she's yeah. saying? Yeah, this all, it all boiled down to doing this podcast for two years so we could bring Andrew on to uh, have this uh, session. Oh, I'm like, oh no, I should have, I should have defined my role yeah. here more yeah. clearly. This is all a trick. Yeah. But it's so true. I mean, we are seeing this is this could be a whole nother episode. We are seeing an absolutely devastating uptick in mental health disorders in children and adolescents. It's a crisis situation. And I'm not saying this is the only problem. What I'm about to say is not the only root of those mental health crises, but it is, I think, a part of it, which is we have taught kids to be afraid of negative feelings. We have taught them that there's no distinction between feeling, feeling angry and completely losing control. And we've taught them to be afraid of failure to such the extent that they think that having negative thoughts and feelings is failure. And I do think this makes them less able to manage discomfort. So case in point, you know, we say things all the time to young children, even loving parents who have the best of intentions. We say things all the time like, oh, don't be afraid. Oh, you know, come on, get over it. Don't be mad. She apologized or you're okay. You're okay. Because I think we're frightened of letting our kids, you know, we don't want our kid to throw a tantrum in target. I get it. But what we need to recognize is that there's a difference between being angry and validating those feelings versus now I've got to throw a tantrum. We're almost teaching kids that you shouldn't have the feeling at all because we're scared that the feeling automatically leads to bad behavior. My whole work exists in telling people that we can actually experience and manage emotions without acting self-destructively on them. And that feeling sad is not the same thing as crying for the next six hours and missing work. That feeling mad is not the same thing as saying something really, really mean to the person that we're mad at. Or feeling afraid 
does not automatically have to mean that we avoid what we're afraid of. You know, I think we've lost sight of the fact that we should label our emotions and therefore they're not as scary. We can manage them. There's a lot of data that says that when we label our emotions, they become more manageable. But I think with kids, what, what do you we mean invalidate when you, their when you emotions. you say label the emotions? In the same way that we'd label thoughts, really. So saying, you know what? I am feeling angry that that happened. And Just being I'm able find to recognize to what it. the emotion is? Exactly. Okay. So recognizing what it is and allowing ourselves to say, yeah, that made me pretty scared. I'll be honest with you. That made me pretty scared. But I think that's frightening for people to do be precisely because of what you mentioned, you know, hey, we don't cry. Let's not feel afraid. I think in our culture, we associate courage and bravery with an absence of fear. Oh, they're fearless, right? I think it would be really helpful if we yeah, redefine courage and it's not brave yes. if you're not if you're not afraid. You might be that's just stupid. Yeah. That's just stupid. <laughs> you might be an idiot. I, I remember I, I worked at a place one time and, and uh, somebody called the boss our fearless leader. And he goes, oh, don't mm. don't call me that. He goes, in hey. in appropriate danger, someone should appropriately be fearful. Yeah. He goes, somebody who's yes. not fearful is just stupid. Yeah. <laughs> might be brave or totally. courageous. He goes, you can call me the brave leader, but not the fearless leader. To be brave, you've yes. got to overcome fear. Yeah. And danger. Absolutely. The bravest, most courageous people are the people who are managing their fears and they're assessing whether or not it's a risk that they should take and they're moving through their fears anyway. But I think, you know, it all comes down to the idea that we have this weird paradox in parenting right now, as I see it, which is everybody says they want their kids to be happy above all else. So therefore, we're so afraid of any given moment our kids maybe not feeling happy that we've taught them to be afraid of not feeling happy. And in reality, we know that the deepest happiness is not the same thing as having a smiley face all the time. The deepest happiness comes from being able to engage with the world and tolerate the ups and downs and be able to embrace the dark with the light and have a sense of meaning about everything and being able to lean in and say, you know what, this was a really hard year. And happiness in this case isn't that I was glad that this year happened because maybe this year stank, but happiness in the sense of profound fulfillment can be can mean, hey, I learned what was important. I gained some insight into myself. There's a sense of meaning through this difficulty. I don't think that's what we teach kids. I think we teach kids that happiness means feeling good, you know, and I think unfortunately we're starting to see kids are not feeling good. And that's why we see them starting to numb their emotions and act out in certain ways because they can't, they can't take it anymore. Yeah. We've created a a pleasure seeking culture and pleasure Mm -hmm. is the highest value. So now we have this, you know, a hedonistic culture where people worship themselves and seek pleasure as the ultimate good. And that leads to the opposite of happiness. It leads to numbness and it leads to emptiness. Um, exactly. You know, I think exactly. there's there's a lot of things that will make you happy. There's a lot of things that won't make you happy. In my opinion, it comes, it's like partly a choice, but also it, it can only be present if you're following something bigger than yourself. Like to be happy is mm-hmm. maybe to be fulfilled, to find meaningful work, to be in alignment with your values. But it's not, you know, like this chocolate cake tastes real good. I'm happy. Nobody would say That's that. Exactly right? Right. <laughs> nobody would yes. say, nobody really truly would it say that they associate happiness with pleasure, but that's, that's the way that our culture approaches it. And Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, part of the reason why obviously people, children get taught to lack in some emotional self-awareness is because that most parents lack in emotional self-awareness. And, you know, I remember having, uh, being young, I had a problem dealing with anger specifically as an emotion. I would, you know, have certain outbursts or fight with other kids or, you know, raise my Mm -hmm. voice or or I'd I'd get really angry and and I would do things that were a problem. And the response, this isn't, you know, I'm not dogging on my parents. I'm saying this is generally, (laughs) generally everybody told me um, how to deal with it and how they suggested that I deal with it was always at the end of the road, right? It, it was about don't do the thing that caused the problem. Don't throw the thing. Don't raise your voice. Don't say the cuss word. Don't insult your friend when they steal your ball or whatever it is. It was always at the end of the the chain of events. It was never even 
acknowledge that you're angry. And, and so I interpreted that as a kid as like, don't be angry. And sometimes people, mm-hmm. that's what adults would tell me is don't be angry over that. Well, I am. And I'm angry because he did this. And it, da, 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 da. like I had a righteous anger. And, well, I mean, and, that's that's sort of, you know, well, right. I mean, you, you want to uh, not don't be angry part, but looking at moderate the behavior. In other words, no, it's OK to be angry, but, but don't throw the rock. I think you know? that's that's so stupid. To, a kid is not going to understand like, oh, don't throw the I'm the problem is that I allowed myself to get so mad that that was that seemed right to me in the moment. Like, I don't think that you can get there. You have to moderate how you deal with the emotion before you get to the point where you're punching someone in the face. If you're so mad and you're allowing those thoughts to race and you're allowing those feelings to get out of control to the point where you are about to punch someone in the face, then then you have a problem that needs to be addressed before you get to the point. You can't cock your fist back and then expect your, you know, irrationally angry brain to hold that fist back and put it back down. And that's the problem that would drive me crazy is people would say like, Oh, we'll count to 10. And it was always weak. Like it was always people that weren't (laughs) like, I could just tell they were never angry. (laughs) It was like, I don't believe and believe you because you don't seem like you could get mad about anything. Oh, don't do this. Yeah. Don't, don't scream. Don't yell. Don't hit whatever. And I'm a little kid going, well, I'm not going to sit there and think about counting to 10 when I'm that mad. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I guess right. my question for you is how do you, how do you blend these approaches and say, well, yeah, the behavior might be a problem, but the thoughts and the feelings need to be addressed before the behavior even becomes an option. Yeah. And I think that's such a beautiful example because that's classic even in adults, right? And the key is that earlier moment. So by the time your fist is cocked, you have gotten to the point where, you know, we can even look at this chemically. Your sympathetic nervous system is on high alert. You are in fight or flight right then. You are so escalated that you feel like the only choice is to go on autopilot. And typically, you know, again, I'm, I always have to sort of chuckle to myself when people are told or people tell kids, you know, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And it's like, okay, can you tell the kid what they are supposed to do instead? And yeah. in your case, you maybe got the count to 10 and said, but that's pretty weak, let, yes. let's say, you know. So what it would involve <laughs> in that case, and maybe counting to 10 and pausing has a moment, but if it's actually more nuanced, as in, as you're counting to 10, here's what you should be visualizing. Here's what you should be noticing. You know, I've worked with so many people where with the anger, it's about noticing it just earlier in the process. It doesn't have to be rocket science. Yeah. It has to be noticing it earlier. My heart is going. My ch- my fists are getting clenched. My jaw is getting tight. My chest is getting hot and it's escalating, escalating, escalating. When you work with somebody on this stuff, they can start to notice it earlier in the process and therefore counteract it. Okay. In this moment right here, I'm not going to do the simplistic count to 10, but I'm going to roll my head from side to side, or I'm going to walk away and visualize something that I've come up with that's very safe for me, or I'm going to do some diaphragmatic breathing where I really, really inhale. And we say diaphragmatic breathing because your diaphragm inside your abdomen is getting full and your belly breathing, you know, people call it, or I'm going to have something that I visualize that actually makes me laugh. Or I'm going to, sometimes with adults, you can say, picture yourself being loved, picture yourself having compassionate thoughts, which sort of short circuits, some of that fight or flight system, or even more purely physical, you know, if you're in on a playground, you know, why not teach a kid like, okay, if you feel that heart start going, why don't you go and do, you know, this little dance or this little exercise, some kids, you can teach them to sort of beat their hands against their chest, like a gorilla. (laughs) And it's so silly. Yeah. That it kind of diffuses the situation. It also gets out energy. You know, some people can have sort of a silly thing that they might say that gets out their energy. So they want to scream. You know, somebody wants to scream at their kids. 
but they have a certain phrase that they scream and se- instead that's kind of a loving, funny phrase. There's, you know, it really has to depend on what feels right for the person. But what all of those approaches have in common is that you're intervening sooner. You're not telling somebody that's gotten to the point of having the clenched fist that's about to connect with somebody's face. You're not telling them, oh, at that moment, you yeah, should count to 10. And past the age of like two, you know not to hit. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. It's like if you're still or exactly. you know not to scream, you know not to yell, yes. you know not to break things. So yes. if you're doing that yes. at four, five, six, seven, it's like you already know you shouldn't be yes. doing that. Um right. It's it, and, and but we keep addressing that behavior all the way to adulthood, right? All the yeah. way, you know, uh judge says, Well, you know, uh, we're gonna have to send you to the county jail for 180 days because you hit that guy at the bar. That's the bad mm-hmm. part. The bad parts yep. you hit the guy at the bar. No, no, man. The bad parts that you let the fact that he bumped into you piss you off so much yes. that you were willing to yes. fight somebody and risk your own health and safety and freedom for what pride? Wow, that's yep. a, wow. I can deal with that a little bit more. And and when I understand, oh, maybe I'm a little bit more prideful than I need to be. Maybe I'm I'm yes. walking on edge. Maybe I'm going through life with a chip on my shoulder. Uh, and, and I'm angry about it. And there's this underlying sense of anger that's with me all the time. So that when I do get bumped yeah. into at the bar, I'm already at 10 because my baseline's a seven, <laughs> right? How do I lower exactly. my baseline? And nobody is talking yes. to people like that or very few people yeah. have that have an adult in their life who talks to them about their emotions, not only anger, all emotions, you know, maybe it's sadness. Maybe you're walking through life with a baseline mm-hmm. seven out of 10 sadness. Well, uh, mm-hmm. you've got to address that. In my experience, it was any time I ever did anything that caused me to get in trouble at school or at home, it was usually the the problem is the behavior and the focus of our conversation is going to be on the behavior. And it was mm-hmm. rare that the focus would even be on the emotions of that moment. Right. And if it was, the, if we did talk in the conversation about the emotions of the moment, usually it was don't feel that way, <laughs> especially when it came to anger, mm-hmm. you know, don't be angry. It wasn't, yeah. hey man, why do you think that that was something that made you that upset? Exactly. And that's what we've got to change. And there were so many interesting points there because I do think depression in men often comes out as anger and irritability. Fear and anxiety often come out as anger and irritability because really what we're talking about is folks who are walking around highly sensitive to threat. So, you know, one little trigger and bam, it's off to the races. I am agitated. We see this with people who've suffered trauma. We see this with people who are underslept. There are so many things that can make you more highly sensitized to threat. And unfortunately, in modern culture, (laughs) a lot of us are just getting more fearful, more agitated. We're not getting enough sleep. There's all kinds of science about what's happening in our environments and in our gut bacteria that might make us a little bit more anxious, even physiologically. There's more trauma. I mean, some of the latest data even out this week about how many teenage girls have been victims of violence. It's so disheartening. And I think what we're really seeing is that there are a lot of people that are walking around just a hair away from exploding. And that's what we've got to fix in the longer term. You know, we talked about those strategies in the short term in terms of when I want to punch somebody, but I think in the longer term, that's exactly the type of stuff that I work with folks on. Let's address the depression. Let's address all of the behavioral things that are going on or the emotions or the trauma that have led to this layer of agitation that is almost always there. Because if we can't bring down the baseline of agitation and fear and anger, then it's going to keep spiking up, you know, because the baseline is so high that, yeah, yeah, somebody looks at you wrong and you're angry. I mean, look at it on the roads. You know, why do people lose it when somebody cuts them off on the road? It's not really about that person cutting them off in that moment. It's about whatever level yeah, they, they were, were already at. death gripping the steering wheel for 45 mm-hmm. minutes in traffic you know i'm going to a job they yes. hate uh leaving a yes. home life that was a wreck you know they have financial they're in financial turmoil they dead up to their eyeballs mm-hmm. that are surviving off diet coke and you know little debbies yeah. and and then you cut them off and now they're <laughs> you know their their cortisol's raised from their lifestyle yeah. and and probably a lack of emotional awareness you know beyond <laughs> that level yeah and lack of sleep too. oh yeah I, I think like overall living a healthier lifestyle is, you know, that's going to benefit every single area of life, whether it's your interaction with friends, family, your social life, your hobbies. 
being healthy in every area of life is important. And, and, you know, one of the things that I've learned over the years doing the work that I do with wealthy families talking about money is that we all have wealth in other categories of life, social wealth, right? Wealth of time, wealth of resources, wealth of skills and Mm -hmm. talents, um, wealth of knowledge. And there's a lot of different types of wealth and being healthy is integral to being able to utilize your wealth, right? Mm -hmm. And and not a lot of people think, think there's a direct line between my physical health and my money, but you have to be physically healthy to even be able to think about how to use your your monetary wealth, the way that aligns most with who you are and what you want to become in this life. So I'm mm-hmm. with you 100%. Um, what, yeah. what do you, beyond physical health, you know, what do you think is the solution to, it seems like changing the way we think is and changing what we believe as a culture is, is the next step to healing all of these problems that we've identified that seems like a really yeah. big aim and a large <laughs> elephant. How do we do that? Right. Right. There are so many areas, I think, of modern culture that really are making people sort of sick, if, if that's the right word to use. And I think part of it has to do with the expectation, once again, of never failing in any way. Right. So we have people so fearful of failure that it really raises their anxiety and it actually cuts down on their resilience because they can't manage the smallest uh, types of upsets. I think we have a fascination with being busy to the point where our definition of productivity is a little messed up. And I think people are constantly busy in ways that aren't meaningful, right? Like, oh yeah, I spent six hours scrolling through my phone last night. And it's like, okay, we feel busy. We feel frenzied. We feel underslept. It's a status symbol to be busy. And I think that's a mistake because it often means that we have to be doing something because we feel that cultural pressure. And yet what we're actually doing isn't what really connects with us. I think obviously we're spending less time outside, which we know from the data I mean, evolutionarily speaking, we're meant to get sunshine, we're meant to get fresh air, we're meant to see sort of vistas of green and horizon. That's meant to calm us because when we could see our environment, especially like why is a horizon like a a sea so soothing to the soul? Well, because it's built in. We could actually know that we weren't under threat right then. You know, whereas why does a cramped space with all these nooks and crannies make us not as calm? Well, because there could be danger lurking in there, right? I mean, that's all built into us. And I think our modern culture has really gotten us disconnected from the very basic things that we know are important. Sleep being a tremendous one. We do get less quality sleep than we did in past generations. And a lot of people have pointed out this might be why we are more fear-based. I mean, if you even just look at the way that political messages um, spread now, there's definitely more emphasis on fear-based campaigning. Why does that resonate so much when it didn't as much in the past? Well, some people say because we're so underslept. That's another evolutionary thing. And I talk about this all the time And because it's so crucial. I mean, sleep is so crucial for our physical and mental health. And yet most of us are not getting high quality sleep. And evolutionarily, we are more anxious and prone to be hypersensitive to threat when we're underslept. It made sense because we used to be in danger if we were underslept. We were sluggish. We're more likely to get eaten. Whereas now there aren't really predators looking to eat us all the time, but we still have that overcompensation of viewing everything as more threatening when we're underslept because that's the the way our brains were wired. So what it means in modern life is when we're underslept, we're more irritable and suspicious and cynical and anxious. And yet we know that our devices affect our sleep. We know that just sleeping with our phones next to us tends to not let the cortisol levels drop as much during rest of the sleep phases as they should, which means we are getting less restful sleep. I think this all is connected. I think a lot of us are running around in really frenzied ways and we don't feel good, but we also don't really know how to reset. And it's hard. You know, if you're depressed or anxious, the last thing that you want to do is really focus on getting fresh air and body movement and looking at your omega threes and your you know fiber levels for gut bacteria. No, I mean you want to kind of 
sit inside and, and eat some processed stuff. That's totally understandable. And I have a lot of compassion for that. And I think we all need to have compassion. And I'm not perfect with any of these habits myself, but I think we need to get real that the data is really pointing to the fact that some aspects of modern culture all, really all of that is of so damage. true. You know, there, there's a, uh, there's a phrase in, in Japanese called forest bathing where you, you go out just into mm-hmm. the woods and, and it yes. wash, let that wash over you. And there's a real chemical that trees, you know, so it says em- emit mm-hmm. that, that you're just a refreshing. There's a reason why, uh, the houses yep. that look out over the beach are more expensive than the ones that, <laughs> that don't. <laughs> Uh, the, Beach house for everyone. Yeah, that's, the that's, solution. that's right. Well, and there, and there's a lot of science to just getting out and walking in, in a, in a mm-hmm. green space. Uh, they've done research yes. in, that shows they, they took two projects and I can't remember, it may have been in Chicago. I may be wrong about that. They took two mm-hmm. projects uh, and one of them had paved over the green space and made it a parking lot. So, mm-hmm. so they were the exact same housing, the exact same demographic yeah. that lived in both one had a green space one didn't. That was the only difference. And the crime mm-hmm. rate in the one with the green space was significantly lower. The The level of anxiety yeah. and tension in the one without it was so much higher. So you're, you're absolutely right. Just getting back to that baseline of understanding what, it, you know, where am I coming from and, and cleansing that whole soul, if you will, and, and sort of starting with, right. with where your beliefs are. And uh, all right. of that, can, you know, being aware of what the thoughts are can, can certainly make uh, decision making <laughs> far, far improved. Hey, thank you so much yes. for being with us. I, I appreciate the time you've, you've spent with us. This was really, really helpful. Uh, tell people where they can access uh, your, your podcast and uh, the work that you're doing. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me and for being willing to talk about these issues, because I think our definition of productivity sometimes doesn't include actually being well and and talking about mental health. So I love it when more finance business oriented folks are are willing to talk about this stuff. Um, So people can listen to the podcast wherever they get their podcast. It's called Baggage Check Mental Health Talk and Advice. It has new episodes every Tuesday and Friday. It's on Instagram at Baggage Check Podcast. And then my personal website is Detox Your Thoughts, named after my most recent book, which talks about a lot of these things that we've touched on today. Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter as Dr. Andrea Bonier, so Dr. Andrea Bonier as well. Um, and I would love for people to keep in touch. I always love hearing from people who've heard me somewhere, who've seen me somewhere, because sparking these ideas, that's why I love teaching too, sparking these ideas and having conversations and then me getting to learn from other people is my favorite thing. Yeah, me too. Thanks so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. My takeaway from our discussion with Dr. Bonnier is how we separate our thoughts from ourselves and that our thoughts are not us, that our thoughts are just thoughts and creating that distance from those thoughts and sort of viewing ourselves as an observer of those thoughts can help us to frame our decision making differently. And a lot of times negative thoughts create negative impacts on our decision making. And so if we can be aware that those thoughts are there, we can moderate that appropriately. Yeah. I loved that part of our conversation. Our thoughts are not who we are. Our thoughts are not necessarily even beliefs or facts or our identity. They are thoughts. So when she talked about labeling our thoughts as thoughts, it I thought it was such a funny request. Did, did you think <laughs> the, that? Did you think that about the thoughts? Yeah, was, uh, <laughs> yeah. My thought was, the thought I was having was that it was funny. Um, but then once I spent some time with it, I realized, yeah, of course it, it's, it needs to be labeled as a thought because if I don't consciously label it as a thought, I may unconsciously label it as something that gives it more weight than it should. You just made a great decision to listen to this episode of Decidedly. Make another great decision and leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support. It helps others find our community and defeat bad decision-making in their own lives. For more daily decision-making insights, check us out at decidedlypodcast.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Decidedly Podcast. Thanks again for listening. I'm Sanger Smith, and this is Decidedly. Insights, advice, and comments provided by Sean Smith, Sanger Smith, and speakers identified as part of the Decidedly Podcast should not be considered recommendations. 
Speakers not identified as members of Decidedly are expressing their opinion, and their statements should not be construed as reflecting the views of the Decidedly team. This podcast is produced solely for informational purposes, not personalized advice.